I will see a clip from In the Name of God. Uh, this was again uh, the Temple Mosque controversy where the Hindu fundamentalists identified a mosque and they said that our God was born at this very site and we're going to knock down this mosque and build a temple in its place. So I've actually re-edited some of these clips, so they're not exactly in the order that they appear in them. They're in the same order, but they're sometimes much shorter than the clips would be if I just planted them. Um, but I was trying to save time. Um, so yeah, the, the mosque, the time that I was filming was 1990, uh, and that was the first time the mosque got attacked. Uh, so I. I filmed a failed attempt to demolish the mosque and this film should have been a warning to the whole country about what would happen if the Hindu fundamentalists were allowed to rise. Uh, but the film was never shown uh, widely at the, at the time. Um, we tried to get it on TV, they, they never allowed us. Um, finally we won, yeah I forgot to tell you that part of the story. Starting from uh, Bombay City in 1985, uh, this film won a national award. Uh, of course, the slums that I was filming in continued to be demolished. Uh, but we also fought it. Uh, after it won a national award, I submitted the film to national TV to show it. Uh, and they refused it. We finally took them to court, uh, saying that how can a government give an award and not, show, not allow people to see the film. So we won court case against uh, the government-run TV on the grounds of my freedom of expression and the public's right to information. Uh, and then following this court victory, I applied the same logic to every time if I accidentally won an award, I would uh, be able to use that in court saying that now they have to show it on TV. And, uh, and I've succeeded so far. I've, uh, They've, we forced the government to show uh, six of my films on TV. Uh, so, In the Name of God was finally shown on TV, but that was five years after the mosque had already been demolished. So, at the time when the film would have meant the most and might have changed the course of events had it been seen widely enough, because it, the film that exposes the fact that that the people who are going for the demolition are not religious at all, they're they are interested in political gain and financial gain. Uh, had this understanding uh, been spread widely at the right time, we might have seen a different course of events. But the film was not shown. Uh, and uh, the, finally the mosque was demolished in 1992, a year and a half after I made this, uh, uh, the film, that, the clip that you just saw. You have to tell you that um, in France this wouldn't be possible. <laughs> I mean, it's not because the film would oh, about gain going, a press, going press going that the TV would accept to, to yeah. screening, so that's a, well, that's, a great that's, example. No, it's a great example, which I'm surprised that at least countries that have some kind of public TV, mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand why more people aren't doing exactly that um, anywhere in the world where there is a public TV. In, in India now, the public TV's role is reduced and we have a lot of private channels. And I don't have a leg to stand on when I go to private channels because, you know, they say we don't, no, nobody's going to advertise with your films. So, I mean, you can't sell Cadbury or anything with uh, showing slum So, uh, so the, uh, so, but I am able to use this argument with a government-run channel or a government-affiliated channel because it's my constitutional right. Okay, so I am the fifth. The religious fundamentalism. But this film is not located in any one incident. I mean, it's not, it's not about one particular uh, story like the demolition of the mosque or the Sikh fundamentalists. It's actually looking at, at the connection between religious violence and patriarchy, the, the, which is something that occurred to me while I was filming, not again beforehand. Um, we, as I started looking, look, I had gone to Rajasthan in 1987, when a woman was burnt on her husband's funeral pyre, and it was—it's called sati, 
and it's an ancient practice. Uh, I mean, it's disputed whether it's an ancient practice or not, but people claim it as an ancient practice. It's certainly a medieval practice where, especially Hindu women that were about to be conquered by Muslim rulers, uh, it was considered an act of glory that they died rather than got raped or integrated into the Muslim rule. I mean, uh, so so rape before. I mean, death before honor kind of idea. Uh, and this sati, uh, while they, the satis happen very rarely now in independent India, maybe three times since independence, uh, but uh, they, the glorification of sati still happens. And there are sati temples and things like that. So this film looks at not just sati, but many other things. And uh, there are two parts in the film. The first looks at what different religions, Hinduism and Islam, uh, has done to women, and the second part looks at the what it has done to the male psyche. In this clip, you will see a combination of part one and part two uh, in just three or four minutes. Uh, the title obviously comes from Christianity, and and that is uh, the title is basically the idea that all religions as we know it today come out of patriarchal uh, society. And, and reflect that patriarchal society. Okay. And I think the, in the audience we have another great activist filmmaker, Lionel Soukas. And Lionel discovered this film last evening. Uh, and he told me that this made him uh, have nightmares <laughs> because of the situation uh, described. So maybe Lionel, if you want to no, just say some words. Just about the situation of the woman uh, that we showed yesterday, but you, you, you make a very good answer. You say, you know, in America it's the same with Bush, we saw so many crime. And it's for all the world. Uh, India is not particular uh, for crime or Oppression more than other country. That's, that's uh, true. So thanks for your movie. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying that uh, it's it's really that it's just your geographic location makes you film in that geographic location. But the ideas uh, that are expressed in these films, I think they could be illustrated in every place. Uh, certainly in, in America, they could easily be. I could have made Father Son and Movie were in America with almost the same logic. Uh, so. Maybe Christophe will add something? Yeah, well, about, about the, the clip, I, I think um, it's very important to some, uh, somewhat give a kind of subtext, because you have this, I think, uh, great juxtaposition of the first scenes. This is the anti-Muslim riot of 1993. And explanations, what he did for fun, Denial, it's God's will, it's not us. Yeah. And you have the quest for virility, yeah. the, quest for, the quest for virility, and, and you know, the, the, the founder of the Hindu movement, Savarkar, is known as Vir Savarkar, because precisely he's supposed to be the real man, and that's the Indo European rule, by the way, virility uh, is a word divine. Vir means both brave, but Vir can also mean semen, the sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, then you have an explanation of anti-Muslim violence that is very mixed and comes ideology last in a way. It comes uh, after, after all this with this great populist who is Baal Takri, the man who spoke by the end. And what some of you may not know is that he died recently and he was incensed by everybody. I could not find one dissenting, one lot of dissent. And hence my question, um, in the previous film there was this priest that you mentioned but, that, but who we, we did not see, who said that Hinduism is inclusive and, uh, and, and, and the old man, the blind old man, was an, an example of this inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. What's left of this inclusiveness today? Uh, uh, well, yeah, I'm an optimist, so I think that the inclusiveness is there in the silent majority. And it's our job to discover that silent majority and give it a voice. 
which is what I do with every one of my films, try to do, is to, to discover uh, the fact that there are secular values, there are humanist values, that are all pervasive. I mean, you can not go to almost any part of the country without encountering it. It's just that you won't encounter it in the middle class elite and the upper class of the urbanized elite that is the beneficiary of liberalized India and India that is uh, that now claims to be a superpower. Uh, but you will find it definitely amongst the people. Mm. Well, Monja, you want to say something too? Yeah, I just want to talk about the um, this sense that you put your finger on just now and about having you know this this silent majority of people trying to find their own voice, their own politics, and how the films. I mean, without this, uh, without the spoken word narrative, um, in per, um, you know, the voiceover or whatever, you manage to um, create um, all of these different positions so that the film in, in itself becomes the event um, within which one can locate themselves um, and find a voice between all of these different forces. Some of them are being played out some of them are almost repeating kind of, uh, um, they're being spoken through almost um, by these forces, uh, such as maybe it's media forces, maybe it's uh, the Hindu fundamentalist religious priest, maybe it's this idea of being a man. But um, there's definitely the sense that there are these forces at play, and um, within it there is this implicated, um, subject, and um, which is not just about you as a filmmaker, which is about everybody, uh, which is not about the here and elsewhere, which is about very much the here. Um, and um, I just, it's, it's more like, I mean, it's impossible to ask a question about this in a way, but I would like to know about, because this has been developing to more and more and more, more and more and more over the years in your work, to such an incredible extent that it's even mind-boggling how you manage to find all these different positions. Um, so I'd just like you to talk a little bit more about this and, and also the editing. Yeah, actually it's not mind-boggling, it's just that if you keep your ears and eyes open, you will hear it everywhere and you... Um, and that's why you never, in most of my films, you never see experts. You never see the theoretician, the, the academic, it's the, the action in the film, not that they are action in real life, but I'm not relying on their testimony or their analysis. I am always looking for those ideas, not necessarily those ideas, but even learning from the ideas that I find at the ground level, because I think that is where the hope in a country like India lies. It certainly doesn't lie amongst the elite, doesn't lie amongst the politicians, and it rarely lies amongst the academics. But that, that's also because you are uh, dealing only with the protagonist of a concrete situation and you, you don't uh, put something else, um, like experts or mm. historians or... <laughs> no, yeah, I mean in the sense that there's no need for the expert because the people can express themselves so well mm -hmm. that there's no need. I mean, it's just that we need to listen. And as Anjali said, it's the... And that's why, that's why the documentary to me is the form that I chose because yeah. I'm not creating anything. I'm not actually making something happen. I'm, I'm only listening and paying attention. But that's why the editing of your film is so important, as Anjali was saying, because uh, it's always very clear. I mean, the multiplicity of the point of views and also the uh, balance between uh, falsification and and exactitude, uh, accuracy. accuracy would sometimes be difficult to understand for someone who is not in the situation. But thanks to the clarity of your editing and the very strong structure of your film, with no voiceover, uh, it becomes very, very uh, pedagogical for everyone. So uh, it's, it's one of the characteristics of your style. I, I do use voiceover once in a while when I fail to make the to connect the dots in any other way and then I put in the voiceover because that's critical information that I think people need when they're watching the film. So either I use voiceover or I put intertitles so that people 
get the connections. But yeah. And also to, to end with my remarks about this, but in your film there is also, like in Rotier, René Vautier's film, very often a very strong sense of uh, equilibrium between disinformation <coughs> uh, in the mainstream media and uh, the truth coming from the action uh, itself and from the facts. And that's also very interesting to, to learn to read the, the press. Yeah, and, and, but if you also would have noticed that the truth, as you call it, and as I would the like facts, to call it, no, no, I'm, I'm not embarrassed. I mean, I do tell the truth as I see it, but mm. truth is always subjective. Um, so, um, but I'm not, uh, I hope I don't make completely rhetorical films where, where people already know what the filmmaker is going to say next. Mm. Uh, I, I would like people to discover what they think from what they're watching. Um, although, of course, I'm providing a lot of direction in that. Uh, but, but I don't want people, the audience to be lazy in terms of waiting for to be told now what what do we what is the solution to this and all that kind of question um, it's it's really there for people to think about yes it's the contrary of more contemporary storytelling uh, in a way okay so we move on because we might run out of time before i finish my clips um narada diary 1995 but actually it's made between 1990 and 1995 it was co-directed with Simon Thinidou. Uh and basically we it is what it said it's a diary it's uh, we came across this wonderful non-violent anti land movement as i said in the eight from the 80s onwards india was in the neoliberal camp. Uh, the World Bank had put money in to build this huge big dam because the World Bank always likes to put money in big projects uh, knowing always that that big projects means big corruption, it means diversion of resources for the elite. Uh, but however, uh, this big dam uh, was being opposed by people on the ground, the people who were uh, in the Gujarat area, were, many of them were of indigenous origin uh, and people who are small farmers whose land is going to be submerged um, who were fighting against the dam, led by Medha Patkar, who is a, not, a kind of a, I guess, a, uh, one of the green left revolutionaries, I would call her. I mean, I might have coined that term. But uh, because uh, in a sense, using nonviolence, using uh, understanding of ecology together with a deep um, uh, connection with human rights and, and justice for the people on the ground. So this is a, a quick look at that. So. Uh, so this. The, the next set of films are, in a way, they're about the negative impact of globalization, the, the fact of big money coming in for big projects, centralized big projects. Uh, another example is this film, which talks about the factory ships that landed in India uh, and were, were depriving the local uh, fishing population of their catch, because they would catch huge amounts of fish and there would be no fish left for anybody else. We just move forward. Okay. The clips that you saw are also mark uh, the fact that by 1995, I couldn't afford making films, um, making 16 millimeter films anymore, and switched to video. Even 1990, the I was making Father, Son, and Holy War, and Narvada Diary at the same time, but Narvada Diary was shot on the second camera, which was a high 8 camera. So these two films that you saw were shot on high 8, which was the early sort of amateur video that arrived on the scene. Um, and so what, what was the difference for you to, to switch from one format? Well, the high 8 didn't look good, but it was cheap. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and and yeah, you could shoot a lot more. You know, I mean, your shooting ratio was. I mean, even uh, my shooting ratios kept increasing with time. I mean, the first few films were made like three is to one ratio, mm -hmm. four is to one. So they they almost uh, you have to really have a good idea of what you were shooting before you shot it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, with Father Son and Holy War, even though it was 16 of them, we were shooting at a 10 to 1 ratio for much more footage. Uh, but by the time we got into video, it was became even 50 to 1 or 60 to 1 ratio of, of material that you shot and what you used. And do you think it's an advantage or a difficulty? Yeah, it is a, it's an advantage and a disadvantage. And I wouldn't say it's a disadvantage. I wouldn't go back to film now. Mm -hmm. uh, especially now that the video and uh, digital filmmaking you can get much better quality, which I haven't done yet because I, I was still, even my last film was made on high 8 and mini DV because that film took 14 years. But uh, uh, but my next, if I if and when I shoot, will be on a better digital camera, which nowadays it looks better than 16mm. 16mm, you must remember, was always a, it was a step brother of 35mm in the sense of the, the uh, stepchild, in the sense not, we, in India, it was always hard to get all the 16mm materials to shoot. And uh, so even when, now when I look at my 16mm films, my video films uh, actually look technically better. You oh, know, really? So you never, you never, not regret, necessarily better, you, but. You never regret the beautiful textures and colors of the 16? Well, I, I regret the editing process, I really loved editing with film. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, have, you have much more time to think and everything. But, and then once you're digital editing, there are, it's a different mindset. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I haven't really thought it out so much. But yeah, but we have to get used to it. It can't be more than the chain end of the people, filmmakers who were in the silent era protested when sound came, and then protested when color came, so you can't keep protesting that. And you, you learn video you by yourself, or did you have... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. As you uh, Yeah. So, uh, along with the longer films that I made, I started to make uh, very short films. So this is a, a kind of a political music video. Uh, again, to do with caste system, uh, and it's obviously post what happened in, in Ayodhya and the Babri Mosque and Temple. So it, this is a, it's a kind of a Dalit, uh, it's a perspective on a Hindu epic called the Ramayana. Uh, so it's, and it's also a way of telling 5,000 years history in, in five minutes. Um, 
it's, it's not even an action, I mean, you know, the Hitler uses the swastika, uh, the idea of the race theory is part of, is similar to the caste theory. Um, so, when Dalits became conscious and started to uh, question these things, they put, turned this, this idea on its head. They started saying that, okay, so you're the Aryans, you came from outside, but we were already here, we're the indigenous people. You, have, you subjugated us and made us into the lower castes. Uh, in reality, today, even these theories are disputed because there may not have been an Aryan invasion. It may have been uh, nomadic tribes that arrived over a long period of time and settled. Um, I mean, the idea, for, it was very popular earlier to think that the Indus Valley civilization was overthrown by the Vedic period, the Vedic people. Uh, but I think there is some truth in the idea that there were different races because in the earliest Sanskrit Vedic texts you, you do have an idea of people who are short and snub nosed and dark skinned yeah. uh, which seem to suggest that they were the local populations. So the Dalits basically as it became uh, mobile, it's not even that it's popular, this idea is not popular but it's there, to, you can find it. Uh, and it's, it's some some writers or some I'm historians sure. like um, like uh, like even um, um, Kosambi and many others mm -hmm. have have talked about this idea that uh, but then after the Hindu fundamentalists were confronted with this they again changed their story and they said oh we we were always here we are not people who came from outside we just went for a walk for five thousand years we get traveled around the world and came back. So that's very interesting, I would say, uh, mindset. Uh, you, you have to, to be there before, the sons of the soul syndrome. Mm -hmm. Then you have another interesting uh, thing that is, uh, if the Brahmins or upper caste dominate, it's because they prevent us from really showing our qualities. You know? <laughs> the idea that you behave the elite who can achieve. Same, so you have this uh, Eklavia story, uh, the archer, it was an Adivasi, but it's the same story. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you just uh, severe the stem of the one that, who can really do better than the, the, than the warrior caste. The warrior caste. Yeah. And last but not least, the last theme that is so well encapsulated there is how all the upper caste in Udvarmani people used the Dalit for attacking Muslims. Yeah. And that's a very, very powerful theme. It's there. It, yeah. it happens. You saw that in the draft repeatedly, and you can uh, just promise some good looting, or, good, or, or you can give some, some, some money, or booze, or anything, and, and get that it's attacking uh, Muslims. Also, because the Mohallas, I mean, the slums, the Muslim slums and the Dalit slums are next to next very often. You have an ally in between, you have a, a, a canal, or you have only a railway line, and that's how it happens. So, this idea that we will not be you, monkey army, is of course very powerful because it's, it makes a lot of sense. You, 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 you must be closer to the Muslims than to the upper caste Hindus, even though you are supposed to be part of their region community. Yeah, great, great material. <laughs> so, okay, so then we come to this is another music video. This is 1998 when India did nuclear, nuclear tests. And uh, when in 1998, May 1998, after the nuclear tests, uh, many people celebrated on the streets and how we had become a superpower. And on TV, there was a music video, which is a pro-atom bomb music video, uh, which we, I was horrified to see being shown on many channels. So I decided to make an anti-bomb music video. And I used a song by Kishore Kumar, who is a, an old Hindi movie song from the 60s. Uh, it, it's kind of like, a, like an Imagine by John Lennon before Imagine was written. Okay, I'll skip this next one and go forward. This is another five minute film, but I think we'll be done out of time, so.
Okay, so same time as uh, the earlier clip, uh, 1998, with the nuclear test, I also uh, began, I, I had already started making another film in 97, which will be shown tomorrow, I think, but I'm not sure you clip now, called Jerry Comrade. But in 1998, I got diverted with the nuclear test. So I made a film over the next four years, uh, uh, basically about nuclear weapons and to some extent about nuclear energy. Uh, this film was shot in India, in Pakistan, in Japan, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and in America uh, because I wanted to understand the dimensions of... Uh, I wanted to understand why America dropped the bombs uh, in the first place. Uh, so this is the trip. This is now well into the film. It's a, it's a sequence shot in a girls' school in Pakistan. Yeah. 
पटवर्धन साहब ने तो हाथ जरा हल्का रखा है हम पे Um, well, I think uh, another film on, on the nuclear situation in India is, um, I mean, when this film was made as well, this is clearly um, a different time to the, to the time that we're experiencing with, um, uh, with the, uh, with the, you know, with the um, Fukushima power plant and the destruction of the Fukushima power plant and the dumping of the nuclear waste into the sea um, in Japan. Um, I think our position in relation to making this film um, is, is slightly different. Um, I think in India at this time, the relation between um, nuclear, I mean, what Anand describes as nuclear nationalism, um, this kind of deadly mix of a kind of Hindu fundamentalism mixed with a, this desire to kind of become more potent as a society um, with, you know, the development of, um, with, with the, the acquisition of nuclear power um, is, is extremely um, frightening. I mean, I can't immediately draw parallels between our work and, and this um, situation. We can in terms of Japan's history um, in relation to after the you know, losing the war and Japan's kind of desire to um, uh, speed up their economy by, by acquiring um, 54 nuclear power plants. Um, but one could say the same thing about France, which also has how many, God knows how many power plants, 100 to 200 power plants. Um, and it's a kind of invisible uh, reliance on this energy that it's not really, I haven't really heard much about that being discussed. Um, in relation to nuclear energy, but maybe Kojo wants to say um, Well, in order to talk about this, I have to have to go go back in time, back to um, back to the film on Bhagat Singh. There, there was this moment in this scene which really uh, struck me. So, when you talk to the Sikh fundamentalists and you confront them with the fact that Bhagat Singh wrote this this pamphlet, this text. Why I'm an atheist, and uh, what you show is what happens. Uh, what you show is the types of denial and the types of rewriting, the instant rewriting of evidence. So when you show them, they instantly say, "Oh, that was written by Congress," or they say, "Well, he was religious." So there are these immediate contradictions that emerge. And so what I was struck with there is this uh, is a is a method of showing what happens when you show evidence so that the film, so that us, the spectators, are, are in this relationship of watching um, a kind of fundama fundamentalist spectatorship where we watch how fundamentalists respond to evidence. In other words, when you confront, yeah, in other words, when you confront religious um, uh, enthusiasts with evidence, the evidence doesn't instantly uh, create um, a response whereby they say, yes, that's a very good point. It's quite the reverse. It does what the Americans call doubling down. So they insist further on their belief. They don't give up their belief. They insist upon it even more. And this, this uh, mechanism by which you show how, how evidence does not uh, clarify a position but enforces it, shows that, that uh, religion does not yield to, to contradiction and does not yield to rationality. That religion has to be, um, has to be uh, analyzed almost by religious means because religion doesn't recognize, religious faith and religious belief do not recognize non-religious arguments. On the contrary, a non-religious argument only proves a religious belief. And, um, and this becomes very interesting in relation to the to the um, to the girls, where they um, where they, they after the demonstration of the debate and after the analysis, they talk about how politicians inflame desires, and so so we begin to understand that religion is a kind of inflammatory discourse, which only amplifies itself rather than and it 
as it were, religion can never be it can never be toned down. It can only it can only exaggerate itself and amplify itself. And this, I think, is compelling because because you show the links between religious fundamentalism and nuclear nationalism, in that they both share this this discourse of inflammation. Um, and so I guess that the question then is, um, is the role of cinema in showing how that functions? And if you could, search, if you could say a bit about how, what, what documentary does when it shows that documentary evidence has its reverse effect, a long-winded way of getting something which, which recurs in your film. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's hard to know exactly how people receive uh, film, uh, but I think I have enough evidence, I keep getting mails from people who watch the films, uh, to, to know that they do make a difference on a micro scale to people who watch them and, uh, and start a process of thought. The, the one thing that uh, I also wanted to point out in what about War and Peace, for those who haven't seen it, is that it, it is, while it started out as a film about nuclear weapons, it also uh, got into the question of nuclear energy and nuclear power, because uh, in fact, the two are so integrally linked. Um, in, if I don't know how much people know about the Indian nuclear energy sector, but India has had a nuclear energy sector right from almost from independence onwards, and to this day they make only about 2.5 percent energy comes from nuclear because it's so inefficient and they they spent huge amount of money uh, to make this 2.5 percent electricity. But the real reason for having nuclear energy is that it's a dual technology. Once you have nuclear energy, you can make the plutonium which you can use for weapons. So it gives you the capability of being a nuclear armed state. So even while India never stated that in the early days, they kept this nuclear project going, uh, not so much to make electricity, but to, to also have, be able to make weapons. But today, with a nuclear deal with the United States, uh, the nuclear program in India has expanded, is trying to expand on an exponential uh, scale and they are building reactors like Fukushima on the coastline. And one of them is a French reactor by the way, the Ariba plant is the world's, going to be the world's biggest nuclear plant in, on the western coast, very near Bombay. If anything goes wrong, Bombay will be destroyed. Uh, and it's on the coastline. It's a failed technology. Arriva has already gone over budget in Finland where they're trying to build a similar plant. Their costs have gone double. Um, apart from costs, nuclear energy today is the most expensive form of energy. It makes absolutely no sense economically to go nuclear today. Uh, but, but countries are doing it. And countries like India are doing it so that they have this dual technology and because they're seduced by the idea of electricity. Uh, there is a question or a remark from the audience on the other side. Excusez-moi, je vais m'exprimer en français. Si vous pouvez, j'ai deux questions très courtes à poser à M. Padoitin. D'abord, je le félicite bien sûr pour son œuvre. Ensuite, puisque je vois qu'il est anti-nucléaire, je voudrais savoir comment il se sent dans le pays le plus nucléarisé de, du monde en France par habitant puisque la France est le pays le plus nucléarisé. Et ensuite, qu'est-ce qu'il pense du voyage en février 2013 de M. François Hollande en, en Inde, où il est allé essayer de placer deux EPR qui sont en construction dans une région où il y a déjà de la contestation antinucléaire the, the... There is a huge protest in, uh, against nuclear plants. Uh, while we started, we, we, we were part of the anti-nuclear movement, we were very tiny. We were the people who were uh, against the bomb philosophically and because we knew what the bomb meant. But today, the, uh, the larger uh, movements against the bomb, uh, against nuclear energy in India, are being done by the people on the ground. The people the fisher people who are being displaced in both Kodankulam and in Tamil Nadu where a Russian reactor is being built and in Maharashtra where a French reactor is being built. So it's a big, very powerful movement. Uh, but the government is very adamant that they want to go through with this nuclear deal. Uh, so I don't know. 
Um, if people are part of the anti-nuclear movement, we would hope that you are able to stop Ariba plant uh, <laughs> in its tracks. Um, <coughs> Yes, I think we have to move on to your last thing because it's so yeah. important. Okay, so we will now go to uh, a Comrade, which is the film that was begun in 1997 and took 14 years to make. Uh, it was completed about a year and a half ago. Uh, it's a three hour film, so this is only a few minutes from that. It's about the caste system, it's about uh, caste system, but mainly concentrated in the state of Maharashtra, which is where Dr. Ambedkar, who is the leader of the people who are considered untouchable, who now call themselves Dalits, which means the oppressed. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Ambedkar was born here and, and uh, <coughs> it remains an inspiration for the whole country, uh, for the Dalit population and for those who have begun to understand that caste is the most horrific thing that exists in India today. from one to the other, no matter what evidence you present, no matter what reason you can present. Uh, so it's a religious resistance which goes beyond religion because it is a resistance that you can see in the nuclear world for sure. And you can see that people are, are religiously tied to the nuclear project. In the face of Fukushima, in the face of I mean, there's only, I think Germany is the only country that has actually reacted to Fukushima. It's probably the only country that actually said we're going to stop uh, reliance on nuclear energy. Uh, and even the right wing in Germany has sort of joined hand with the Green Party on this front. But everywhere in the world you see the opposite, complete denial. India certainly is in complete denial and is, is, uh, is well on the path towards buying all the second-hand journalists they can find. Um, and uh, so also, I'm sure France is in that position also. I, I don't know if France has stepped back from the nuclear brink. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, what happens when people like that watch a film like this? I think they probably have some kind of defense mechanism that prevents them from looking at it. At the same time, evolution can, can come sometimes from religion as well, and the Dalits you're showing us are Buddhists, many of them, and Ambedkar has converted to Buddhism to liberate from some religion and embrace another kind of religion in uh, his people. And, and, and I think that's very interesting, um, rather, the, the, there is also an emancipatory uh, potential in religion. We, we may return to that, but if, if I may ask one question that really turned to be personal in the end. Uh, when I saw this film, which is a fantastic film, I was of course struck by the title, you know, Jairim Comrade. And Comrade is of course a communist word, and Ambedkar was dead against the communists. So I wondered, what the hell is this collapse of these two, uh, I would say, expressions uh, reflecting? And, and and that's my question, in fact. Uh, you mentioned the left repeatedly during, uh, well, repeatedly, several times. And, and you even coined this green left uh, activist uh, phrase. 
But what is the left, which is so much associated with the communists in India? I think any of your films. And, and how does the Queen's Party of India, or the two, CPI and CPIM, uh, and, and their intellectuals, uh, consider uh, about your films, especially when you look at gas as such an important uh, problem for India. Uh, and they have ignored gas for so long, and that was a problem for America. There is only a, a class system in, 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 in India, which is communist. So um, I think it would be interesting, because uh, the title of the last film reflects this mm -hmm. question, to, to, to tell us more about your uh, say, relation to these people. Uh, yeah, we have, we have several questions in one question, so I'm going to lose track, but I'm going to try and keep track so you can remind me. Mm. Uh, firstly, about Dr. Ambedkar, uh, for those who don't know, Ambedkar was uh, a great scholar who, had, who, despite being a Dalit, was able to get an education, went to Columbia University, got a PhD, uh, came to London School of Economics, got another doctorate, and became a lawyer as well, and he was perhaps the best read amongst all Indian political uh, leaders of the time. Uh, and definitely amongst this time, there's nobody reads anything. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Ambedkar is complex in the sense of his understanding of communism and the left. He is a critic of the left, uh, of communism, and he even wrote a book about that. But he's also incorporated a lot of left ideas in his own thinking. So he's, he's very much a product of uh, the enlightenment of, uh, say, people like maybe John Stuart Mill and many other uh, people, uh, Fabian socialists. Uh, so the left thinking is very much embedded in his understanding of the world. So you can't call it, he's certainly not an anti-communist in that sense. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, the communist project of the left what should have been, for the communists it's crazy that they didn't ally with the Dalit movement much more closely because if you are a communist, how could you ignore the poorest of the poor, the most oppressed sections uh, and not learn from what, what they were saying and what Dr. Ambedkar was saying. So the fact that the communist movement on the left and, uh, uh, and Dr. Ambedkar went into contradiction to some extent they did, and that is the tragedy, I think, that had they not done that, um, then we would have seen a different India. Um, uh, the other thing is that Dr. Ambedkar is also very much a constitutionalist. He's the author of the Indian Constitution. So his idea of change is not armed revolution. Yeah. It is about enshrining rights in the Constitution, making sure that society changed through the law and through society and through agitation, of course, but, but also that the law must be there. Uh, so that is sometimes in contradiction with those from the left or extreme extreme left that believe armed struggle, they have to overthrow the system, they're not going to be within it and work within the constitution. So there are these tensions. Um, anyway, I won't talk about Jaibin Comet title till you people until uh, everyone sees the film, because it won't, it won't make sense. It's tomorrow. Then the government is tomorrow. Um, and now I come to the second thing that you said. Uh, so one was the Indian government, and I've, I've forgotten. Religion, religion and, and Buddhism. Uh -huh. ah, yeah, and Dr. again, uh, Dr. Ambedkar converted with thousands of his followers from Hinduism to Buddhism uh, as a way to assert that this was a religion that oppressed us for centuries and we're walking out. It's, it's uh, quite instructive, the fact that he didn't uh, advocate atheism, although he chose a religion that is essentially atheist. He chose Buddhism, which doesn't talk about God. Buddhism is, talks about the improvement of man on earth then how can we better ourselves? So, so Buddhism, if at all is a religion, it's much more a philosophy, it's much more a, a means of human beings bettering themselves. And so Ambedkar chose Buddhism out of the greatest rationality. And he didn't even choose the Buddhism as he found it. He, he rejected some aspects of Buddhism as, uh, you know, his idea was that he was, this is not what the Buddha meant, or this is not really the Buddha at all. Like, 
the theory of reincarnation, which to him sounded irrational. I mean, there's no evidence for it. So he doesn't go around looking for the next Dalai Lama to be born in some village. Uh, he says, no, there's no reincarnation. This is uh, so he's taking Buddhism as he likes it, in in very much the same way that Gandhi took Hinduism very much the way he liked it. He never certainly supported traditional Hinduism. He reinterpreted it. So I would consider both of them liberation theologists mm. uh, and people who were bringing their own ethics into the what they call that religion. But but I'm better thought that if he's going to get his people to walk out of Hinduism, he had to have another religion, otherwise people wouldn't do it and people would people need to replace they needed a community and that community could be provided by conversion to another religion. So he chose the most rational one he could find. Il est presque trois heures euh, déjà, c'est incroyable. Euh, Est-ce que ouais, quelqu'un voudrait se charger d'une d'une question dans la salle, une dernière, une avant dernière question? Yeah, so in present day India, documentary as a medium. How strong a week do you feel it is in reaching the masses or getting it shown to people? Like how, how much screenings do you have, it, have it in India? Um, I can't speak for every documentary, but I can talk about mine. Um, yeah, by and large, I can speak for every documentary that it's extremely, even though today the documentary medium, because the technology has become much easier than it was and accessibility is not a problem, you can get small cameras, cheap cameras that shoot very good uh, quality video. Uh, digital cameras which you can get, which are very affordable and you can edit on your own computer. So hundreds and thousands of films are being made uh, because the technology has changed that way. Uh, but the bottle, the real problem is with where are these films shown? So there are very few outlets for documentary cinema. Uh, if you're not part of the government and if you're critical of the government, it's even even more difficult. Uh, so I don't think that has significantly changed uh, since the time that I began making films. Film festivals internationally have become <coughs> spaces where documentary filmmakers aspire to show their films. So the films are are often shown in festivals and go into a circuit, but they don't. They rarely are shown to the people that they're about. They're, they are once in a while, you find filmmakers doing that, but it's not a common thing that the films are used uh, well or often uh, in India uh, to go back to the people that you made the films about. Uh, and that activity is, it's a major task to actually spend as much energy showing films as you do making films. But that, that's also why you, you will put your film online? Uh, uh, no, yeah, awesome. that, that's also why I'm uh, as much a projectionist as I am a filmmaker. I, uh, <laughs> apart from being a lawyer, you have to go to court all the time. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time showing these films because uh, there is no ready-made mechanism in India to show these films. On the net is okay, but on the net is a good idea in the future, but as yet in India, very few people have computers. I mean, only the elite have computers. So, internet access and all that for long format films. I mean, what you find on YouTube is usually very short films. Mm -hmm. So, some of my short films I've already put on YouTube. Um, but it's important for the young generation. Yeah, but and I'm, I'm trying to find out, I'm trying to, uh, eventually I will have free streaming on my website mm -hmm. so that people can watch the films. Uh, and, and I might put a PayPal button for those who want to contribute if they feel like it, but it's not necessary to contribute to watch it. So that's my future, one of the future projects is to make the films uh, accessible. And I've heard the films have been screened all over India and that not a day goes by almost without the films being screened all over India. Yeah. And in fact, Jaibin Comrade's premiere was in Bombay in the, um, um, I was just saying that the, um, um, 
that the film is, the films, as far as I have known from knowing your work for many years, that the films are constantly shown in India and constantly shown um, in, in kind of... Um, a year and a half after I made this, uh, uh, the film, that, the clip that you just saw. You have to tell me that um, in France this wouldn't be possible. <laughs> I mean, it's not because a film will oh, about gain a prize, going prize going that the TV would accept to, to yeah. screening, so that's a, well, that's, a great that's, example. No, it's a great example, which I'm surprised that at least countries that have some kind of public TV, mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand why more people aren't doing exactly that um, anywhere in the world where there is a public TV. In, in India now, the public TV's role is reduced and we have a lot of private channels. And I don't have a leg to stand on when I go to private channels because, you know, they say we don't, no, nobody's going to advertise with your films. So, I mean, you can't sell Cadbury or anything with uh, showing slum dwellers. So, uh, so the, uh, so, but I am able to use this argument with a government run channel or a government affiliated channel because it's my constitutional right. Okay, so I am the fifth. The religious fundamentals. But this film is, not located in any one incident. I mean, it's not, it's not about one particular uh, story like the demolition of the mosque or the Sikh fundamentalists. It's actually looking at, at the connection between religious violence and patriarchy, the, the, which is something that occurred to me while I was filming, not again beforehand. But we also fought, a, uh, after it won a national award, I submitted the film to National TV to show it, uh, and they refused it. We finally took them to court, uh, saying that how can a government give an award and not show, not allow people to see the film? So we won court case against uh, the government-run TV on the grounds of my freedom of expression and the public's right to information. Uh, and then, following this court victory. I applied the same logic to every time if I accidentally won an award, I would uh, be able to use that in court saying that now they have to show it on TV. And, uh, and I've succeeded so far. Uh, they've, we forced the government to show uh, six of my films on TV. Uh, so In the Name of God was finally shown on TV, but that was five years after the mosque had already been demolished. So at the time when the film would have meant the most and might have changed the course of events had it been seen widely enough, because it, the film that exposes the fact that, that the people who are going for the demolition are not religious at all, they're, they're interested in political gain and financial gain. Uh, had this understanding uh, been spread widely at the right time, we might have seen a different course of events, but the film was not shown. Uh, and uh, the, finally the mosque was demolished in 1990. The idea that all religions as we know it today come out of patriarchal uh, society and, and reflect that patriarchal society. And I think the, in the audience we have another great activist filmmaker, Lionel Soukas. And Lionel discovered this film last evening. Uh, and he told me that this made him uh, have nightmares <laughs> because of the situation uh, described. So maybe Lionel, if you want to no, just say some words. Just about the situation of the woman uh, that we showed yesterday. but you. you you make a very good answer, you say, you know, in America, it's the same with Bush, we saw so many crime, and it's for all the world, India is not particular uh, for crime or oppression, more that other country, but that's uh, true. So thanks for all your movie. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying that uh, it's, it's really that it's just your geographic location makes you film in that geographic location, but the ideas uh, that are expressed in these films, I think they could be illustrated in every place, uh, certainly in, in America. Um, we, as I started looking, look, I had gone to Rajasthan in 1987 
when a woman was burnt on her husband's funeral pyre. Uh, it was, it's a, called sati and it's an ancient practice. Uh, I mean, it's disputed whether it's an ancient practice or not, but people claim it as an ancient practice. It's certainly a medieval practice where especially Hindu women that were about to be conquered by Muslim rulers, uh, it was considered an act of glory that they died rather than got raped or integrated into Muslim rule. I mean, uh, so, so rape before, I mean, death before honor kind of idea. Uh, and this sati, uh, while the, the satis happen very rarely now in independent India, maybe three times since independence, uh, but uh, they, the glorification of sati still happens. And there are sati temples and things like that. So this film looks at not just sati, but many other things. And uh, there are two parts in the film. The first looks at what different religions, Hinduism and Islam, uh, has done to women. And the second part looks at the what it has done to the male psyche. In this clip, you see a combination of part one and part two. Uh, in just three or four minutes. Uh, the title obviously comes from Christianity and, and that is, uh, the title is basically, I will see a clip from In the Name of God. Uh, this was again uh, the temple mosque controversy where the Hindu fundamentalists identified a mosque and they said that our God was born at this very site and we're going to knock down this mosque and build a temple in its place. So I've actually re-edited some of these clips, so they're not exactly in the order that they appear in. They're in the same order, but they're sometimes much shorter than the clips would be if I just planted them. But um, I was trying to save time. Um, so yeah, the, the mosque, the time that I was filming was 1990, uh, and that was the first time the mosque got attacked. Uh, so I. Film, I filmed a failed attempt to demolish the mosque and this film should have been a warning to the whole country about what would happen if the Hindu fundamentalists were allowed to rise. Uh, but the film was never shown uh, widely at the, at the time. Um, we tried to get it on TV, they, they never allowed us. Um, finally we won, yeah I forgot to tell you that part of the story. Starting from uh, Bombay City in 1985, uh, this film won a national award. Uh, of course, the slums that I was filming in continued to be demolished. Uh, 